A couple of things I want to bring to your attention here before we get things started on today's show. The first is that I'm just using my phone, no headset here today, so hopefully everything coming across the air just fine. But the second is that over at bangthebook.com, lots of good content available for you. I just put up my college football and NFL opening line reports for the two weeks here that we've got conference championships and then also another slate of NFL action. Also over there at the website, check out those free contests that we have available. Just sign up using your email address. You can get involved in those daily streaker contests, monthly pick of the day, top monthly win percentage, top ROI, top number of units won, cash prizes available for those. All we do with that email address is send you out a newsletter, tell you about what's going on over at the site. So please feel free to check those out. And while you're doing that, take a look at the matchup data section that we have as well. All the sports covered, side-by-side comparisons of these teams, stats, per game stats, trends, all sorts of different things to help you bang the books. Finally, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio is presented by DSI Sportsbook. You head on over to DSI, use that promo code BTB and the number 25. You get a $25 free bet just for signing up, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, and 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino. At Bet DSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two guests coming your way here today. The first, Mr. Joe Everett from NFL Draft Bible for our NFL Week Interview and Monday Night Football Preview. Joseph, how's it going today, man? Doing great, Adam. Uh, hey, the, the chalk keeps winning in the in the NFL, so hey, I'm, I'm sticking with those favorites, man. It's doing really well in that regard. <laughs> uh, it is it is remarkable. You know, I was I was talking to my boss yesterday. We were kind of pissing and moaning about the Super Contest card again, which is just a weekly occurrence at this point because it feels like everything that we thought we knew about betting the NFL is wrong this year. Like you said, chalk keeps winning. Situational spots almost don't even seem to matter here. You, know, you it also seems like we rarely have the good teams playing down to inferior competition. Patriots cover 17. Philadelphia easily covers two touchdowns. We did see it a little bit last night between Pittsburgh and Green Bay in the Sunday nighter, but overall it feels like these good teams are, are actually you know, blowing out who they're supposed to and then playing exciting competitive football against uh, comparable opponents. Hey, call it boring, but yeah, it's like oh, New England, 7-4 ATS. You know, Carolina is kind of getting back to where they were a couple of years ago. I mean, outside of those Rams and sure, Philadelphia is just they're a whole different animal. I'm going to put them out in a cage somewhere. Hopefully they don't uh, beat the crap out of my team as well, but it is kind of these good teams sticking to and uh, just, I don't know, I, like, I don't want to call it boring because I enjoy it because, like, at least some of it, to me, at least on my end, is starting to make sense. Like, geez, Minnesota, uh, like we talked about on a previous show, that defense is just winning at the line of scrimmage. They're setting the tone in games, and it's like, man, that's, to me, that's fun football to watch. I think one of the big things is that it's kind of a catch-22 because, it's exciting because you know that the playoff games should be really good this year and that, you know, hopefully we'll wind up getting a really good Super Bowl. But on a week by week basis, Cap, I mean, from a fan standpoint, if you like watching good teams, you know, carry the load, that's fine. But betting, I think, is difficult. But I think overall, you know, as we look ahead to the playoffs, which are, you know, what, about a month or a little over a month away now, that's kind of the solace that we can take out of this is that, you know, we should see Philadelphia going toe to toe with a Minnesota or New Orleans, or a Rams team, something like that, that's when, you know, it kind of pays off that we have teams that are as good as they are. Yeah, and get rid of some of those double-digit uh, numbers that are just tough to tough to get on the right side of a lot of times. All right, well, let's take a look here at this Monday Night Football game, which doesn't exactly profile to be a real exciting one. And, of course, you know, that was kind of the thought with the Sunday Night game between Green Bay and Pittsburgh, and that wound up being – one of the more exciting games of the weekend with Pittsburgh nowhere near covering as a two-touchdown favorite. Uh, Houston and Baltimore here on Monday night. Baltimore, seven-and-a-half-point favorite pretty much across the market. A couple stray sevens with some extra juice out there. And, you know, again, we, we've talked about this a lot throughout the season, and we're obviously going to start with it here. The Baltimore defense is legit. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's no question, and we put that out there before at uh, Dean Pease. Big fan of what he's done, just the job he's done. It's such, such intricate defense to watch, but I, it, the ultimate question remains in all these Ravens games. Can they score enough to win? Uh, I think the Texans, they've got some holes, namely at corner uh, safety. Uh, the issues in that back half the remain. So the Ravens, I mean, 
they just basically have to neutralize Clowney. They find a, a chance to take some D shots with Wallace, Macklin. I think there's opportunities there. It's just the speaks so much about team identity. The Ravens, they want to run the ball. They're dying to run the ball and pound teams, but they got some questionable running backs right now and they don't have those those tone setters they used to have. Calicio Semele, I'm now in Oakland, a Marshall Yanda on injured reserve. So that same punch. It's just not there. So, unfortunately, Joe Flacco, he's just got to play well here. And I know that since this guy's getting paid a bunch of money, franchise quarterback, but that's the problem. He's a little bit overrated, uh, definitely a lot overpaid, and uh, they really have to call on him. And they, re- once again, kind of have to go oppo. This heavy set, run power team that loves play action, they need to turn that around, I think, and uh, kind of approach used to pass to – to set up opportunistic runs if they can kind of get into that mode of thinking. If they do, I think they score well enough because that on the other side, the Texans are just a level down. I mean, obviously the quarterback, everybody knows, but Will Fuller, if he's not playing, that's electric speed. I don't care what defense, you know, we talk about the Vikings being great. The Jags have a nasty, but they don't have a guy that can run with Will Fuller all game long. Uh, that is just a rare type of deep speed. And when the Texans are without that, I think that's where they get in trouble. Uh, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, man, that's 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 a rare commodity. And I'm, I like to consider myself a bit of a wide receiver aficionado just because all the, the fantasy writing I do, the dynasty, the keeper leagues I have to play. And, boy, you got to scout wide receivers well to do well in those leagues. And Hopkins, man, I don't care who he's matching up against tonight. To just get some popcorn, have a have a pop. It's it's worth the show. He is always worth the price of admission. But in this game, how he's going to beat the brackets, how he's going to beat the double teams, that's going to be an issue. And then problems for the Ravens defense potentially. C.J. Mosley only got in one solid practice this week. That is their best linebacker, uh, arguably one of the better in the league. There. He is, uh, I think, the ankle injury, and then Jimmy Smith, he's kind of slowed up by an Achilles the whole year, and Terrell Suggs is a mystery, I think, on this injury report. He's downgraded because uh, I don't think there was an issue before Friday, and all of a sudden he's limited, and then Saturday he didn't practice at all. So I would not be surprised if um, Taxaw, they call him, doesn't even play. So that that's something to think about on that other side of the ball. But other than that, I, I expect Dean Pease to kind of to dial up the pressure. That If we know anything about Ravens history, they tend to do really well against statue quarterbacks. And I think Tom Savage lives up to that bill. He's not a scram- he's not creative in the backfield. And uh, they've got enough pass rushers even without Suggs uh, to get to him. So, yeah, it's um, – looking like a lot of Baltimore in this one. You talk about DeAndre Hopkins, and I think it's kind of incredible. You know, I was against Atlanta yesterday. I took Tampa Bay and and got front-doored in that game since Atlanta scored late, but Julio Jones just went off. 12 catches, 253, a couple scores. We'll talk about the Falcons here in a few minutes, but it is amazing to me how these guys, like Hopkins, like Antonio Brown, of course Antonio Brown's got a little bit more of a supporting cast now, and and especially with Le'Veon Bell there, Uh, but Julio Jones, you know, A.J. Green, these guys that draw so much attention from the defenses and they still go out there and eat. It's incredible to watch. I mean, no Will Fuller this week again for the Texans. So it's going to be the DeAndre Hopkins show. And that's what I'll be curious to see is, you know, we see these hallmark wide receivers, these, I don't know if DeAndre Hopkins is ever a Canton type of wide receiver. Antonio Brown should be, you know, uh, Julio Jones should be as well. But you see these Canton type guys just go out there and shine no matter what. So, what do you think the plan here is for Baltimore to try and slow him down? Uh, like I mentioned, it's it's, it's got to be a bracket. You have to have two out there and just uh, say, hey, I don't care if it's Bruce Ellington, uh, Braxton Miller's out there in the slot, the Fedora Wicks, whoever, you can just go ahead and let them have at it. Uh, we're going to make sure we've got two men on him at all times because he's such a rare bird, uh, specifically in how many snaps. It's been going on since college, too. If you watched him at Clemson, he doesn't take plays off. Uh, Sammy Watkins over there at Clemson, um, Martavis Bryant, the uh, the Pittsburgh receiver, all those guys were in and out. It's all rotating around Nick Hopkins. And uh, the, what he's able to do and keep coming back, it just 
And it, it, even when he doesn't take the plays off, he's still at the same clip every play. Uh, physically, he is just, yeah, he's rare. And it is, the, like you mentioned, just consistent it is no matter who he's, his opponent, no matter really the quarterback, he's making plays. And, I, I, you know, you can't say it for every player in the league, but he's worth a highlight reel every time he sets foot on the field. All right, so one other thing to ask you about Baltimore here, and the Ravens, if this number stays 7.5, will tie for the highest number that they've been asked to cover this season. Of course, they did cover 7.5 against the hapless and hopeless Cleveland Browns in Week 2. Last three weeks here, you've got a 40 to nothing win over Miami, lose to Tennessee 23-20 to in a, a very interesting game there, and Baltimore actually snuck in the back door to push or win for a lot of people that had that number higher than three. Last week, the shutout of Green Bay, 23 to nothing on the road to cover two and a half. This is a big number, though, for Baltimore. You mentioned Joe Flacco. You mentioned that you know, there's not much of a downfield offense at all whatsoever for Baltimore right now. So the question kind of becomes, you know, how low can Houston keep this game to try and stick within the seven and a half? Because you don't expect the Texans to do a whole lot. So how much can this Texans defense do you know, to stop that short passing game of Baltimore and, and take away the running game? That's the question. I, I I just don't I don't see the the, the Texans stopping them often enough. And uh, if Baltimore is able to turn that field and switch things around on one of their you know uh, namesake turnovers, I think it just uh, that that should be part of the team. It should be in the crest. You know, like what we do is turn the ball over and get defensive touchdowns. If that happens, then. Yeah, sure, obviously that they'll cover. But just looking at how much the, the, the Texans continue to give up and uh, what was it, the show we were talking about, like guys that should affect the line, Whitney Merciless, J.J. Watt, what this defense is without them, that really takes the, the bite off that pass rush. And once guys like that are out, they're giving up 41 to Seattle. The Colts scored 20 on them. I, well, obviously, we can take the Rams out. They're just scoring on everybody. But still, even in their last game, what the the, the, the Cardinals found a way to get points. So, yeah, I, I've got to think uh, with a quality defense that they find a way to cover this game would be my uh, lean. Uh, but if it is, what is it, over a touchdown, I'd be awful tempted to, to buy that hook. All right, well, let's take a look back here at Week 12 and, and talk about some of these teams and some of these results as we like to do on this week in review part of the show. Uh, the Blaine Gabbert Bowl, as you referred to it here in the notes that you sent me, Arizona, Jacksonville. This is one of those games that I don't think it's going to get a whole lot of run that Arizona won 27-24 as a six, six-and-a-half-point dog at home. One of the things that this does tell me, though, is when you have teams that are trying to set new standards, you have teams that are trying to – create that different type of culture. And that's what Jacksonville is trying to do this season. The fact that Jacksonville just didn't look good for long stretches of this game kind of makes me wonder, you know, what type of echelon we want to put this team in. I think this is another one reset that, yes, the Jags were looking good, but uh, we had mentioned previous, like there's still issues. And uh, I, the one thing, or, no, two things, just you mentioned, Thank God there's a culture change. You know, Doug Marone, flat out winning in spite uh, of Bortles, and just you know, he deserves a ton of credit there. But you can actually count on a few things in every Jaguars game, is what I took away from this. Uh, you can count on one or maybe two Blake Bortles turnovers. They're like you can just uh, set your watch to it. And then the other one, uh, we talk about defenses that their hallmark is you know scoring. The Jags find a way. Some have like hell or high water. It's a pick six. It's a fumble recovery. They're in the end zone, and those defensive players are dancing. So. It just keeps happening too many times. So at least there's something you know to, what to expect in Jags games. But Portals, the guy is amazing. Uh, you could run a bloopers reel just from this Cards game. Uh, he's falling down, tripping over his feet. He actually did on a bootleg. He lost his footing, fell on his butt. Uh, he got up because there was amazing protection for an incompletion. But the the other one, the sprint right go, he throws the ball, and this Tyron Matthew uh, right in his face picks him. There's uh, the, there's a lot of quality, uh, laughable material from Bortles. But the one thing that's happening is that 
he is willing himself through these games just with his scrambling and his rushing. And anybody that saw the highlights knows, like, it, it, there was some rushing touchdowns that if Blake doesn't make a move on a guy in open field, I mean, they're basically running the zone read on a lot of those plays. And it, it's just, you know, there's a lot of what not to do in Blake Bortles' footage, but you can't take away that he is a he, he's a tough kid and he's had to make some plays. But – to me, this is an interesting game because you mentioned, like, you know, teams that, like, there's a culture change. I don't, I just don't think the Cardinals have given up on anything for some reason. Like, there's a lot of want to there. Chandler Jones is a manimal number 55, that pass rusher that they got from New England. Uh, he's just a total difference maker. You just, that you have to double team a guy like that. And uh, I liked what I saw some of Blaine Gabbert. I mean, yeah, there were some big time mistakes, but he's a more mobile option than Stanton. He's got a little freelance to him, um, but he's got a bad offensive line. You need someone that can extend those plays and uh, just buy that extra second or two. It, uh, I think they really, they're going to benefit from giving Blaine a look. Just Blaine's going to benefit more than anything, but you could do a lot worse for a third string quarterback. I mean, there was a really nice deep ball. You got the Brown uh, beat all the coverage. Sure. It may have been overthrown, but it was exactly over the deep safety. So he's doing what he's supposed to do. And I guess if I'm taking anything away, like I call it, it's the Gabbert bowl. He got his revenge. Unfortunately, Clay is Campbell. Uh, scored a touchdown in the game, but did not beat his former team. I'm seeing, I don't know, just a little value maybe in Arizona. You know, what are they playing the Titans? Who, well, I was dead wrong on them uh, the previous weeks. That Marcus Mariota, I don't know what we're seeing. If if I'm getting points maybe with Arizona against Tennessee, I'd be t- tempted to take them. And yeah, Arizona's a team. I, I don't know. There's just just a scotia value. I'm trying to. Find little as we mentioned, these spreads are getting so tough. Uh, maybe maybe the cards are a team you need to just keep on the back burner and uh, wait for that prime matchup because there's definitely there's just some players there. I mean, the Adrian Peterson, some flashes. As I mentioned, Chandler Jones, Honey Badger's still alive. Patrick Peterson, there's some pride on this defense, and I think there's like I said, there's maybe just something there out in Arizona. Well, props to my favorite all-time Cleveland Brown, Phil Dawson, for nailing that 57-yarder for Arizona there to give them the win. And, you know, for the Cardinals here, three catches for 12 yards for Larry Fitzgerald. Team high eight targets, but he's only able to haul in three of them. If you're Jacksonville, that's really not a game that you want to lose. I mean, obviously you don't want to lose any game. But if you can shut Larry Fitzgerald down and still find a way to lose the game, that's kind of demoralizing in my opinion. You know, Leonard Fournette, very ineffective, just 12 carries for 25 yards. Bortles was the only guy that could run for Jacksonville in this game with the scramble. And, you know, I think that it's it's one of those things where I think it's a, an interesting contrast between teams. You've got this veteran Arizona team that knows how to win, knows how to persevere through some of those tough spots. Yeah, they've had a couple of down years here because of injuries and because some things just, you know, all right, haven't gone their way. They've been kind of a, a team that's run bad in those coin flip types of games at the end but they pull out this one and like you said they're still out there fighting what's fascinating to me though is we kind of take a peek ahead to week 13 a little bit it almost feels like this win didn't mean anything in the betting market Arizona still a touchdown home dog to the Rams so we talk about perception biases in the NFL we talk about you know looking at things on a week-to-week basis the Rams beating New Orleans New Orleans obviously you know a top team here in the NFC this year they got pumped up a little bit from that win in terms of what this line looks like in the betting market. I mean, Jacksonville was laying five and a half, six in that game. Now the Rams laying six and a half, seven. Are the Rams better than Jacksonville? I don't know. Is it a travel situation to where the Rams have a shorter trip? I don't know. But what I do know is that it doesn't look like Arizona is getting the respect that you're alluding to from a betting value standpoint here. So they could be maybe a little bit of a live dog here this week. There's no doubt about it, and uh, I, if anyone thinks the Rams are just going to keep on racking up points, uh, this is a defense that they've they've seen them before. They got a pretty what it was it I think they got shut out it was it zero to nothing uh, losing to the Rams. So there's a little revenge factor there. 
uh, yeah, I don't think they're getting enough respect. And I just, like a, the rest of the way kind of thing, uh, playing Tennessee, playing the Redskins, a Giants team you don't know what you're getting out of. Uh, this, this, just a lot of uh, opportunities, I think, that could arise for that uh, group. And, yeah, definitely it's you, – you, you mentioned it, they're, they're not getting respect in the line just on the look ahead to this week. All right, I know you're kind of dreading this point because the Denver Broncos are your team despite living in Indianapolis. So you do follow the Colts, Colts closely, but Denver is your team here. And, you know, just another ugly loss for Denver. I mean, Paxton Lynch kind of looks okay at the outset. Then some things don't really go his way. Trevor Simeon winds up coming into this game and threw a couple of touchdowns, but again, just 11 of 21 passing. Uh, Oakland, kind of a, a workmanlike 21 to 14 win here in this one to, to pick up a nice victory after that ugly game against the Patriots. But man, I at this point, I just what do you do with Denver? I mean, this is a team now that's three and eight, a team that's accustomed to winning. It's the opposite of, of a Jacksonville situation where Jacksonville trying to learn how to win, trying to to move up into that next tier. Denver here, a team that has won, a team that's gotten a Super Bowl over the last couple of seasons, and now they're just sort of in free fall mode, and, and I don't know when they actually hit the bottom. Well, they got to be close. Uh, the son of John Denver has to be fading Denver. I mean, I love how they can't admit that Trevor Simeon right now is the best option. Uh, but that's not even the problem. We uh, the one episode. I mean, it's I like to look at players who just totally sway the line. If they're not playing, and then you you just you know don't make the bet. But that their one player is Von Miller. He's MIA. I, I think he's got a sack, maybe sack and a half in the last five games. I haven't like he is on the side of your little milk carton there. It's just. It's embarrassing that he, like, he's supposed to be that team deodorant that fixes uh, the tonic for the bad team. What do you call it? The stir that straws the drink, whatever it is. He's not uh, anything. He's not the best player on the field. He's far from it. And coaching's one thing. Dropping Von Miller in coverage is beyond me. I don't understand that theory, and I never will. Best One of the best pass rushers in the league. I'm not dropping him in coverage, except for the rare exception, just to fool somebody. Uh, but you know, be that as it may, it's uh, yeah, the the whole new coaching. Like uh, Paxton Lynch is one thing. To some decent throws, a lot of it was just check downs, hitting over the middle, crossers. He got a nice wheel route that probably should have been a touchdown. But uh, I think he just. It's not a serious injury. I think he just got benched for bad play, and people were like, "Oh, it's this is hurting his confidence." This injury. It's no. I think it's like the actual poor play. That's why he's crying on the sideline. The kid probably got a little nice dose of reality. This is one of the worst defenses you're going to play in the Raiders who just switched up their off, uh, defensive coordinator. They got issues at corner. They can't stop the pass, can't stop the run, and they, you didn't really do anything. So I think that's kind of a really uh, smack in the face to Paxton. Hopefully, you know, he rebounds from this. But this that, that's the problem this year. Like, they're just going to be bad. This uh, they totally lost their identity. I think on defense, they keep to leave fighting and ganking chains. I mean, heck, that's been going on since last year. But at least we kind of had control of the roster. I think uh, Vance Joseph, man, he's he's got to be ready to get fired. He's got to be a one and done. Uh, he's supposed to be some defensive guru, and the Broncos. They don't even resemble last year's team. They're, they're, I think they're one of the worst defenses in the league right now, and it's not because of talent. It's just there's no accountability. There, there's no leadership. And, yeah, I'd just be I'd be shocked if uh, Vance Joseph uh, doesn't get uh, let go in the offseason because this is just why you let Wade Phillips out the door is beyond me. But then this whole uh, letting this Vance Joseph uh, come in here, he wasn't even that good at uh, Miami. So I just, yeah. John Elway, it's uh, it's all on him right now. He's got he's built himself a fine mess. Is the is the problem? Yeah, no doubt. And, and I think what's also really difficult for this team is that you know you kind of look at the the dispersion of the targets that they had in the passing game, and there's just nothing downfield. You know, I mean, you've got checkdowns to Devontae Booker, you've got checkdowns to Jamal Charles. You know, C.J. Anderson wasn't really a factor in this game, and if he's not a factor, right now he's probably the best offensive player for Denver with the injuries to Emmanuel Sanders and then with Demarius Thomas pretty much ineffective with the uh, the quarterbacks that are there. I mean, Demarius Thomas' longest catch yesterday, he had five catches. His longest reception was six yards. So this Denver offense is just a, a, a comedy of errors right now, and 
like you said, I mean, I, I don't know what you do from this point for. I mean, you're almost kind of looking at a full-fledged rebuild situation where you know, you've got some players on the defense, but they are getting older. The offense is just in, in dire need of somebody that can captain the ship here, and I don't know if that's a quarterback in this year's draft. I don't know if that's a free agent quarterback that you go out and get. For the Broncos here, I mean, they're, they're fading until further notice at this point. I just I see no way that you can back them in any tangible situation and yet some books have them a favorite on the road in Miami this week, which is a pretty big indictment of what the Dolphins are as well. <laughs> oh, poor Matt Moore and poor Dolphins backer. That's a whole other story. But I think they are facing a rebuild. The only way is they look in the mirror, be honest, and say, okay, Paxton Lynch was a mistake. I'm sorry. You, hey, self, I'm sorry about that. And, hey, put Kirk Cousins out there. He's not going to re-sign with Washington because of that contract. He has to go somewhere. If you get the veteran quarterback, maybe, the new coach has worked with Cousins. Uh, and safety would be nice. Morgan Burnett's not going to re-sign with the Packers. That's a, another veteran you might add to the mix. But, yeah, outside of hitting, hitting uh, the, the, you know, all sevens with a free agent quarterback, I think they are looking at a rebuild. And I'm, I hate to repeat it, but they really have to be honest with themselves and just look at this whole quarterback room and say, uh, eject, just hit the eject button and uh, start from scratch. I think maybe you keep Chad Kelly, but outside of that, I just, yeah, I don't like anybody in this room right now. All right, let's talk about the Atlanta Falcons here. As I mentioned, they front doored any Tampa Bay backers with that touchdown around the two minute warning yesterday in the fourth quarter. 368 passing yards on this Tampa Bay secondary. And this Tampa Bay secondary has just been a problem all year long. As I mentioned, Julio Jones, he went out there, had a huge game, 12, 253, a couple scores. Trick play from Mohamed Sanu was a big part of it as well. But I, I look at this Falcons team, and, and they're 7 and 4, and you know they had that big second quarter here to put this game away. And Matt Ryan seems to be getting more comfortable. Week after week, the completion percentage looks a little bit better. He looks a little bit more comfortable in the pocket. You know, they're starting to find ways to get Julio Jones the football, which is obviously the most important thing here with this offense. But you're not sold on the Falcons. Neither am I. But you're the guy with the uh, the talent evaluation background and the scouting background. So what is it that you're seeing from Atlanta here that, that doesn't really have you uh, buying in? Oh, yeah, I mean, Lee Corso would have his pencil with the not-so-fast here, right? I mean, that, I don't think you have to be any – guru or quarterback whisper to know Julio Jones is the best player on the field. It's just the real questions why it takes Steve Sarkeesian this long. I mean, he, sure, credit to him. He's obviously fine-tuned some things. I mean, there's a lot of concepts he's got to change, I'm sure, just to, to, to kind of acclimate to the pro game and the pro, pro players probably. But, uh, yeah, the finer points out of Muhammad Sanu showcase it. What a great season he's enjoying. And then Tevin Coleman, we've said it on the show before, that kid's the star himself, even without Devontae Freeman. But they should have kicked the snot out of Tampa Bay. Right now they're a terrible team. They're missing a lot of corner. Tampa Bay is just a beat-up team, too. And they've got the talent to just – road grade them if they wanted, pass if they wanted, and they did. They passed it well with Julio, but good for them, but uh, I, it, they're just something still there. It's like a friend you work with. You know they're sick. They don't want to fess up to it and admit it, but you know they got to finish out that week of work. Well, everybody knows you've got something, bro, and like that's what I tell the Falcons too, man. There's a flu virus or something, you know, just go get checked up because there's and I think it's on defense. I mean, they, they're they trying to get that Seattle thing going, and I have praised their team speed in, in the past, but that side of the ball still doesn't have – I want to say it's not the attitude. It's still the physicality. They don't beat people up on the front line. They don't have that heavy front rotation, and the front four is the, the biggest issue. So Dan Quinn can dial up any blitz he wants. It's not going to be as effective without Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill, uh, you know, back at – all those rotational players they had. It's um, Yeah, this is a team that's just skeptical and, you know, looking up. They've given up points to bad offenses. I mean, Tampa shouldn't really score 20. Carolina, the Jets, Miami, uh, Buffalo looking at it. They've all scored 20 or more uh, against this Falcons team. So I just – you have to wonder what happens when they play a real team. What happens when you play Minnesota? They still haven't played the Saints at all this year. So this is a Falcons team, you know, 
good for them that they've kind of pulled out of it on offense and you did realize that Julio Jones is not just the best player on your team, maybe one of the best in the league. Uh, but, yeah, there's just got to be more. And I don't. I just don't – I'm not sold on Mark, on Mark Juan Manuel calling this whole thing. And, yeah, what is it next week? If it's the Vikings, minus three at home. I mean, I'm – I'm eating that up right now. Give me some hunting glasses because I'm on Mike Zimmer's side, and we're gonna go. We're gonna get some deer after this. Yeah, and, and you can kind of see in the market out there a little bit. Atlanta opened three with extra juice, and now it's three with extra juice on Minnesota. And looks like we got a shot to go down to two and a half here. And I think that you're on the right track with that. And also, the Falcons play the Saints twice in 17 days. Once on a short week, that one's at home, and they play them again on Christmas Eve on a short week. Uh, after playing on the road at Tampa Bay. So we're going to find out a lot about Atlanta here over the next four games because that Tampa Bay spot becomes a little bit of a sandwich, albeit with extra rest, with the two Saints games in there. And then, you know, who knows what the status of Carolina is going to be on New Year's Eve. So for Atlanta here, these last five games, very, very tricky. You look at what they've done to date over the last few weeks, you know, struggled with the Jets on the road, lost to Carolina on the road, Needed a second half flurry to knock the Cowboys off once Sean Lee left that game. You know, one at Seattle, but Seattle is a team that has a lot of issues, as we've talked about already. Then this Tampa Bay game, like you said, not as uh, not as impressive as the score might indicate. So, you know, for the Falcons, we're definitely going to find out some things over these last five games of the year. All right, let's talk Chicago Bears here for a minute. I was on the Bears in the Super Contest, I mostly because I figured at some point Philadelphia needed to to drop off a little bit. I also thought Chicago's defense would play fairly well, but Chicago's defense at this point just so worn down with the fact that the offense completely lacks any level of efficiency whatsoever. They can't get any time off. You hit the nail on the head there. But I just – I hate – I do not give up on coaches that I love. And Vic Fangio, he's got to be given some credit to doing what he's done here. And they just – they ran into a buzzsaw last week. I mean, this traveling to Philadelphia and getting your ass kicked by the Eagles. That's happened to a lot of teams this year. You go to Philly and you come out with a black eye and a broken jaw. Well, that's you know, a lot of people have had that same scenario. I think that, that Eagles, if you look at them on defense too, they may be one of the best tackling teams in the league. Even when the Bears made plays, they had some they were just wearing an Eagles coat as soon as they had the ball. So, it's, you know, good luck for anybody on the rest of that uh, Philly schedule. But I still think that defense, uh, the point of attack, they're winning a lot of plays. And those corners uh, on the Bears don't have a lot of talent, but they're jumping routes. They're stripping the ball. They got a early uh, fumble on uh, LeGarrette Blount. I'm just – what they're missing is that Leonard Floyd. It'd be nice if he was on the edge. Uh, he definitely, you know, when he's not in there, it makes an impact. But as long as they've got Akeem Hicks, that big defensive lineman, healthy, uh, and, and they still have those running backs. I'm, I, it's a team I just hate to give up on because, yeah, sure, they didn't run for anything, but when you're down 24, uh, what, nothing at half, it's, it's tough to get any running game going. And Trubisky, it's just I think it's a matter of finally – getting these receivers to stay healthy one and develop those tight ends. If I'm, I'm still screaming for my man, Adam Shaheen out of Ashland, this guy is going to be a playmaker. It's just a matter of when, um, but yeah, it's just the uh, Dell Loggins, Vic Fangio. I'm sure John Fox is a goner. This team may be lost, but those are two assistants. I think it's similar to what's going on in Dallas right now. You, you basically have Jason Garrett as the uh, eye candy and then Scott Linehan's behind him actually running the offense and coaching. And then on the defense, it's the, uh, the, the you know, uh, well, it's not Kiffin, but uh, they have uh, Marinelli running that cover too now. So I, I think it's kind of similar. This Vic Fangio is doing a great job coaching. I love Dal Loggins. So I think I, for whatever it's worth to listeners, those are two assistants. That you want to just kind of earmark right now, find out where they go, I think they're going to continue to do some good things, not only in the future, but I'm just glancing at the Bears' schedule, San Francisco, at Cincinnati, at Detroit, against Cleveland in those next four games. I'm I'm still ready to – maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment, Adam, but I'm ready to get behind these Bears and take some points if I can get them with a team I know can keep some games close because I just – I think – there's some value to be taken off of just getting that spanking from Philly because a lot of teams are going to get that. It, now 
swoop in, you know, maybe get yourself a couple extra points on the Bears. Yeah, I think it's challenging. I mean, the Bears opened a five-point favorite this week against San Francisco. That number's down to three and a half. And and, and the biggest problem I have with the Bears right now, I, I like Vic Fangio. I love Dowell Loggins. We've talked about that before. I even saw Jeff Dickerson over at ESPN.com speculate that maybe John D. Filippo would be a good guy to bring in as the head coach. He's currently the Philadelphia quarterbacks coach as somebody to work with Mitch Trubisky, or maybe you elevate Loggins, the head coach, some kind of thing like that. Loggins and DeFilippo work together in Cleveland, so you know, maybe that little bit of familiarity would help. But the problem is, I, I'm not going to say the Bears have quit, because they've played you know some fairly competitive games here, lost to the Saints by eight, lost to the Lions by three. Uh, you know, that game against the Packers at home was, was a pretty ugly one. But I do wonder what the mental state of this team is. With a lame duck head coach in John Fox, with, you know, probably what appears to be a pretty axis season in terms of free agency, you know they're going to draft high. I just kind of wonder, you know, they are playing some dregs here the rest of the way, specifically San Francisco and Cleveland, but I just wonder what the mindset is of this team to go out there and, and win games like that, and especially to do so laying points, because they're going to close a favorite against San Francisco this week, maybe a field goal, maybe two and a half. They're going to be a favorite over Cleveland. Everybody's a favorite over Cleveland. But you have to wonder, is this team motivated to go out there and win football games? And I, I don't know if I can answer that right now. No, it's it's a major question, Mark. Uh, the only thing I stick to is a lot of these players still have families to feed, and uh, they've got to know just like, yes, they are out of it, they're going to be drafting high, but – just as we mentioned, John Fox is out. This coordinator, that coordinator out. Everyone, they clean house. It's not just a new coach. It's a new system. It's a new regime. It's it's a new survival. So they're forced to get some good footage out there if they can in, in these last few games. And I think that if you're an evaluator, speaks out louder than anything. It's like, yeah, this game's over. This season's over. The whole year is done. And look at how hard this cat is playing. He stripped this ball. He fumbled. You know, it just uh, – it's something I think that still holds true with pros in college, of course. I mean, like that's my senior year. I'm getting ready for the draft. Two fingers. I'll see you later. But in the pros, there's still some room for guys that have to, uh, like I said, just for survival's sake, uh, put good footage out there. A lot of good insights on today's show from Joe Everett of NFL Draft Bible. What's going on over the Bible right now, Joe? Oh, well, we've got um, the John Blair back with his Inside the War Room series. So every week you get that probably at the end of the week. We've got our daily scouting reports. And right now, underclassmen have started declaring, as I, as I mentioned, just uh, making their draft decisions. So we'll have uh, our breaking news segment fired up. You can uh, check it all out in NFL Draft Bible. You can follow Joe on Twitter at Joe W. Everett and at NFL Draft Bible. Joe, thank you so much for your time, man. We really, really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again next week. All right, looking forward to it.